start to roar, there'll be a big time when the new Nash gets found. You'll want to shout. You remember those fellows and their good news song. Just about this time last year, they brought you the first word of what were to be the hottest cars on the highway. The 1949 Nash Air Flights. Not only that, but they also qualified as prophets. Their jingles were fact, every line of them. There was a big time when the 1949 Nash Air Flight hit town. The biggest announcement time in the history of any Nash dealer. For the crowds were there to admire the sleek beauties which made real their dreams of a truly post-war car. They said in words that the 49 Air Flight was the car of the year, their car of the year. And they said the same thing with orders. They said it with orders so emphatically that during 1949, new all-time sales records were established. Yes, we of Nash are riding the crest of the wave as the 1949 model year ends. The greatest wave of public acceptance in our history. And for 1950, our sales objective is clear. To stay right at the crest of that wave. To capitalize on the public acceptance we've gained. This can and will be done. For your 1950 line of Nash cars is a line built to sell. A line built to be tough competition in a competitive market. That's the sales strategy built into the cars we're proud to announce. The finest for 50. Your new Air Flight Statesman. Successor to the Nash 600, the finest car in its price field, now bearing a new name, as distinguished as the car itself. And your new 1950 Air Flight Ambassador, one of the four finest cars in America. First, let's have a quick summary of the principal reasons these two cars will keep us right on the crest of the selling wave in 50. First of all, for both series, the advanced aerodynamic body lines, which were the design sensation of 1949, have been retained and for a very good reason. This year, air flight styling will make more sales for us than ever before, since we now have as sales ammunition newly discovered facts which prove the superiority of Nash design, facts which took months of engineering research to verify, facts which constitute the most powerful story on body styling ever put in the hands of any automobile salesman. In both series, there is new interior luxury, the Sky Lounge safety interior, High style comfort that'll catch your prospect's eyes at first glance. In the Ambassador, there's a fundamentally improved engine with higher compression ratio, making it one of the highest compression engines on the American automobile market today. Finally, as an optional extra on the Ambassador, you offer your customers the convenience of hydromatic transmission, the most popular and most thoroughly proven fully automatic transmission on the market today. Not only that, but your prospect have in the Ambassador their choice of three transmissions, a conventional three-speed transmission, or, at extra cost, either the Nash Automatic Overdrive or Hydromatic. That's a good summary of main points. So now let's examine these new cars point by point. First, the advantages which are shared by both series. The big automotive news of 1950, news broadcast by every means of advertising and promotion at the command of Nash, is going to be Nash Aerodynamic Design, and the research which enables Nash to make and prove this startling statement. Here it is. Because the smooth aerodynamic design of the Nash body offers less air resistance than any other full-size car body, a Nash requires less horsepower and therefore less gasoline to maintain highway speeds than any other full-size American car. That's a sweeping statement but it's backed by truly scientific evidence. Evidence gathered during months of research conducted at the Aeronautical Department of the University of Wichita by engineers entirely independent of Nash. They used the university's big wind tunnel and testing equipment following the accepted research techniques used in the creation of all modern passenger aircraft. It was truly a free-for-all at Wichita. For tested with Nash under identical conditions, were cars which constitute a real cross-section of the automotive industry. As for results, well, to start with, there was dramatic proof of the importance of true aerodynamic streamlining. The average car rolling along at 60 miles per hour is actually devoting six out of every 10 horsepower at work, 60% of all the power it's using just to overcome air resistance. But what is the rating of the Nash Air Flight in this important respect? 
At 60 miles per hour, every competitive car tested would require more horsepower than Nash to overcome air resistance. In fact, the average of all cars was nearly five horsepower more. And the difference could run to over nine horsepower more than a Nash would use. At 80, the competitive cars would use an average of over 11 more horsepower to overcome air resistance. And some cars at 80 would use as much as 22 more horsepower than Nash. And every extra horsepower means extra gasoline consumed. Yes, with this evidence, which another one of your Nash training films will cover in more detail, you'll not just be talking streamlining, as your competitors will have to do, you'll be proving true aerodynamic design. You'll be proving that your Nash saves owners money because its design is aerodynamically better. And you'll be the only salesman in the entire industry who can say all that and prove all that. Next, Sky Lounge Interior Styling, another new feature that'll make sales for you whether you're talking to a prospect for a statesman or an ambassador. There's an instrument panel that's a study in trim-lined functional beauty, as new, as clean and fresh-looking as tomorrow morning. There's a roll-back aluminum shield with a durable silver-like finish at the center of the panel. This conceals a recess which contains the radio controls. The shield can be locked to prevent unauthorized radio concerts in parking lots, for instance. Finally, as an important convenience feature, the old glove compartment has given way to this roomy bin-type storage locker, located within easy arm's length of the driver. In upholstery, there is emphasis on new materials and new color combinations, with a choice of fabrics and colors so wide that any Nash buyer can be the interior decorator of his motor car. For instance, the Statesman Super Series offers two standard upholstery combinations plus four options at slight extra cost a total of six possible selections of colors, patterns, and fabrics. The purchaser of an Ambassador Supermodel has his choice of four upholstery combinations at no extra cost, plus one option at slight extra cost. Then, in the custom models of both the Statesman and the Ambassador, there are dramatically styled two-tone upholsteries featuring the bold use of solid color, which is a keynote of modern styling with an option of four combinations of fabrics and colors at no extra cost. In addition to upholstery, there are a dozen or more other new touches of styling elegance. The coach lights, which glow above the assist cords. The many restyled items of body hardware and similar refinements. But there's another body improvement which can be appreciated at a glance. The big, very big rear window of the 1950 Nash. 178 more square inches. 33% bigger than last year, giving the driver the safety of maximum rear vision as well as contributing effectively to the modern styling of the car. Here's a feature that'll delight the pocketbooks of Nash prospects, the new Sealflex oil control ring, an economy feature on all Nash engines. Made up of many U-shaped segments in a one-piece construction, this extremely flexible ring has a new principle of expansion control that enables it to hug the cylinder wall tightly. It does this even when the wall has worn to a tapered or somewhat out of round condition, as shown here in exaggerated form. The ring's performance, therefore, remains efficient far longer. Then, too, with this new seal flex ring, oil consumption is accurately controlled until the ring is entirely worn out. The consumption remains low, yet the cylinder wall receives proper lubrication. And here's the net result of these advantages. Because of seal flex rings, a Nash engine can now operate up to three times as long before ring replacement is needed. Another 1950 change is the use of a shield between the battery and the engine to protect the battery from engine heat and thereby prolong its life. And of course, in both series, there are minor but pleasing changes such as the larger, more massive bumper guards and the spring-loaded cover which conceals the gas tank filler. This year, both the weather eye and the convertible twin beds are substantially improved. As for the bed, not only can the right front seat be let down individually so that one person can sleep while another drives, but this year, as an extra cost option, that right front seat can be adjusted to any one of three intermediate positions, ideal for lounging or napping. In the 1950 weather eye, there are two defroster fans instead of one, and they operate directly at the defroster openings. As a result, 60 to 75% more heated air is delivered to the windshield than last year. 
Well, that's a quick summary of the changes that have been made in both the Air Flight Statesman and the Air Flight Ambassador for 1950. But there are other and important improvements. In the Ambassador engine, there's a combustion chamber of new design. It brings about more complete combustion of the fuel mixture and therefore gets more power out of each drop of gasoline. And it raises the compression ratio to 7.3 to 1. This improvement, of course, means better and more economical performance. And even with this increased compression ratio, the Ambassador engine is designed to use low-cost, regular gasoline. To improve performance still further, the valves are inclined from the vertical, resulting in a smoother flow of fuel mixture and therefore better combustion. The new radiator is the vertical tube design, the type least liable to clog. Then, as an important comfort feature, the Ambassador steering wheel has been raised to provide more knee room for your longer leg prospect. Hydromatic transmission is, of course, the top-ranking new item in the list of optional accessories available with the 1950 Ambassador. In fact, you will see a special film explaining just why Hydromatic Drive is a sales ace for you, detailing its advantages, giving tips on how to sell it. So we'll leave the Hydromatic story to that film. In the Statesman engine, the piston displacement has been increased by more than 6%. The result, of course, is more flashing getaway more breathtaking performance than this car has ever before displayed. Well, that's the story on the new features of the 1950 air flights. But it's only part of the array of facts that'll make sales for you in 1950. After all, we know the features of previous models. But those old features will be brand new to most of your prospects. That fact makes them important sales weapons. For instance, there's the safety of air flight construction, the unitized body and frame, Floor, roof, fenders, sides, and pillars built as a single rigid welded unit, squeak-free and rattle-proof. The roomy comfort of the nice sky lounge interiors. Living room comfort for six big people. The matchless operating economy of both the Statesman and the Ambassador engines, which in the case of the Statesman has been proved to be more than 25 miles to the gallon at average highway speeds. Economy gained in large part through such exclusive engine features as sealed in manifolding and the revolutionary Uniflow jet carburetor. Then there's the incomparably smooth ride provided by coil springs on all four wheels. There are extra values, like the Ambassador's exclusive seven-bearing crankshaft. Well, to sum it all up, these are truly cars of the future, the cars of our future. The cars which will enable all of us, salesmen, dealers, and factory, to capitalize on the public acceptance the Nash Air Flight has already won and convert that acceptance into sales. Yes, these are America's most modern cars. The cars your customers will be proud to own. The finest for 50, the Air Flight line, the Nash Statesman and the Nash Ambassador. So let's all start today and make them come our way and have a big time when the new Nash is Today, public interest in automatic transmissions has reached a high pitch. Prospects are definitely interested and inquiring about them. And buyers have shown their preference for automatic transmissions by ordering them in an overwhelming majority of cases where they are offered as optional equipment. Nash has been preparing to meet this great demand and now offers on the Ambassador the finest all-around automatic drive on any car, the Hydromatic. You can tell your prospects enthusiastically that it is the best automatic drive on any car. You can answer questions and overcome objections with confidence and conviction. Here's why Nash decided on the Hydromatic. Nash never experiments at the expense of the public. Before the war, some manufacturers offered automatic devices that proved to be unsatisfactory in service and were discontinued. While Nash did a great deal of experimenting and research of its own, it also kept a close watch on developments by others in the field. On new, major developments, it should be realized that it generally takes years of experimenting, testing, and improving before any device can be regarded as thoroughly proven and ready for the public. An automatic drive has been the dream of engineers since the beginning of automobiles. As a matter of fact, one of the first was tried out in 1904. 
After all the intervening years of development, there emerged in 1939 the first hydromatic drive on the production automobile. With the experience gained from over a million owners, plus the knowledge learned from hydromatic installations on tanks during the war, the hydromatic entered the post-war passenger car field as the most reliable and best proved automatic drive available. Today it is a thoroughly dependable and accepted feature, and that's one of the main reasons why it is offered by Nash. Another important reason is, hydromatic gives the owner the greatest combination of advantages of any drive. We'll discuss these advantages a little later, but first let's see how it works. There are two things to be noted as we look in from the driver's side. First, there is no clutch pedal. Second, there is a selector lever on the steering column convenient to the steering wheel. This is not a gear shifter. The selector has four positions. N for neutral, D for driving under normal conditions, L for low range in special situations, such as to give increased engine braking on steep downgrades. R is for reverse, and when the lever is in that position, it also applies a positive parking brake in the transmission. All normal driving is done with the selector set at D. Once the lever is moved into this position, the driver has no clutching or shifting to do. Hydromatic does all that for him. The drive is a combination of a fluid coupling and a fully automatic transmission. First, let's see how the transmission operates. The transmission can be divided into two principal systems. One, the gears, and two, the control. Let's look at the gearing. The transmission provides four speeds forward and one in reverse by a special system of gearing. The gears used are called planetary gears, shown here in a simplified way. We cannot get into a complete explanation of how these planetary gears work because it would require a great deal of technical detail. But an important thing to understand about planetary gears is that they are always in mesh. They cannot grind nor clash. If we hold the large outside gear to keep it from turning while power is applied to the center gear, that small gear between them would move around inside the large gear. It would go around at a reduced speed, but with increased turning power. In other words, this planetary system would then be in low gear. The result to keep in mind is that planetary gears permit different gear ratios by merely holding one of its members and without shifting the gears. A planetary gear system can give us two speeds forward, a low gear and direct drive or high. With two sets of planetary gears used in combination, one after the other, we can obtain four different speeds. And that's the way four speeds are obtained in the hydromatic transmission. The hydromatic transmission is automatic because gear changing is automatically controlled by oil under pressure. This pressure is produced by two small gear pumps in the transmission. Oil is supplied at the right pressure to the right place to automatically give the right gear ratio. There are three ways in which this oil is controlled. One, by the selector lever on the steering column. Two, by a governor in the transmission. And three, by the accelerator pedal. We'll explain each of these briefly. The selector lever we have already mentioned. This lever does not shift gears, but moves a valve in the transmission that directs the flow of oil. Once the driver decides to go forward, he or she merely sets the selector at D for drive and steps on the gas. From there, a governor in the transmission takes over the job of automatically selecting the proper gear ratio. The governor is a device for regulating the flow of oil that controls the selection of gear ratios. The governor itself is regulated by the speed of the car. When the car is stopped and the selector is set at D for drive, the transmission automatically goes into first gear. But as the car picks up speed, the oil pressure controlled by the governor is directed to the proper gear changing mechanism, shifting the gears from first to second. At still higher car speeds, the gears shift to third and finally to fourth. During this gear changing process, the driver does nothing but hold his foot on the accelerator. He doesn't have to lift it between shifts. In slowing down, the governor will automatically shift the gears downward. 
Now, there's just one other control over the gear changing, and that's by the accelerator pedal. Stepping hard on the accelerator in any gear delays upshifting to the next gear till the car reaches a higher speed. For example, in making a normal start, the automatic change from first to second gear would be made at around six miles an hour. But with full throttle in first gear, the shift to second would not be made until the car is going around 16 miles an hour. The more the accelerator is depressed, the longer the change is delayed from one gear to the next. This feature of the hydromatic gives the driver control over how fast he accelerates. The harder he steps on the gas, the higher speed he attains in the lower gears. Like keeping a car in second for a fast pickup with an ordinary transmission. Now there's one other way the accelerator controls gear changing. If the driver wants to change from fourth gear to third, he simply presses the accelerator to the floor and the transmission automatically goes into third gear. This action is similar to the automatic overtake on a transmission with overdrive. Before leaving the transmission, it should be mentioned that reverse is accomplished by a set of gears in the rear of the transmission that are brought into play when the selector lever is moved to R. Now let's look inside the other unit of the hydromatic drive, the fluid coupling which is mounted on the forward end of the transmission. The fluid coupling has three principal parts, a driving member, a driven member, and a cover. The driving member has veins around its inside. If this driving member is rotated in a fluid such as oil, these veins will force oil outward. In the fluid coupling, the driving member is rotated by power from the engine. The action of the driving member is like that of an electric fan that blows air when it is rotated. If we place a second fan in front of the one blowing air, the second one will rotate because of the air being blown against it by the first one. The second fan thus picks up power from the first one. The same action occurs in the fluid coupling. The driving member, rotated by engine power, throws oil against the driven member and is thereby able to transmit power. The veins in both these members cause them to act like fans. When the two members are enclosed by a cover, the fluid coupling is complete. Note that the oil can circulate over and over again and that there is no mechanical contact between the driving and driven members. Only the flow of oil transmits the power, providing a clutch of great smoothness. When the engine turns slowly, only a small amount of energy is carried by the oil. At idling speed with the car standing still, there should not be enough force in the oil to move the driven member. The more slowly the driving member turns, the less tendency there is for the car to creep forward. And here is where Hydromatic uses an exclusive feature. In Hydromatic, with the car standing in low gear, the driving member turns at a slower speed than the engine. This slow turning reduces the flow of oil, so it will not transmit enough energy to the rear wheels to make the car creep. This reduced speed of the driving member is an exclusive feature of Hydromatic. It has less tendency to creep than any other type of automatic transmission, and yet, it is more efficient. When we increase the speed of the engine, the driving member will turn faster, giving more energy to the oil. The fast moving oil flows against the driven member with greater force, and the increased power is transmitted to drive the car. When the car is set in motion, the driving and driven members turn together so that the engine's power is efficiently transmitted. In the hydromatic, the flow of power from the engine is divided when the car is in third or fourth speed. 60% of the power goes through the transmission by direct mechanical drive, and only 40% through the fluid coupling. This is called divided power flow and is more efficient than a fluid drive alone. It's another exclusive hydromatic feature that accounts for its superior performance and economy. So far, we've covered how hydromatic works. This has been done for your information, but with most prospects, you won't want or need to go into so much technical detail because most prospects are only interested in results. In other words, what hydromatic will do for them. So let's review the results and advantages of hydromatic, the selling points you will want to cover with your prospects. Selling point number one. With Hydromatic, there are no gears to shift and no clutch pedal to operate. All the driver does 
is set the selector indicator. For all normal driving, this will be at D. Then, Hydromatic shifts the gears from first to fourth. The driver doesn't even lift his foot off the accelerator to make the shift. Selling point number two. By use of the accelerator, the driver has two controls over shifting. From a standstill, the driver can accelerate slowly or fast, as he chooses. Because shifting speeds are controlled by how far down he pushes the accelerator. Also, the driver can downshift from fourth to third by pressing the accelerator to the floor. This gives a powerful pickup for overtake. Selling point number three, engine braking on hills. The driver moves the selector to L, and the transmission stays in first or second gear, depending on the speed of the car. Selling point number four. Parking on steep hills, the driver moves the selector to R, which, with the engine turned off, locks the rear wheels and positively prevents the car from rolling in either direction. High dramatic advantages over other automatic drives. Number one, lack of creep. Because the speed of the driving member of the fluid coupling is slower than that of the engine, Hydromatic has decidedly less tendency to creep than other automatic transmissions. Hydromatic advantages over other automatic transmissions. Number two, divided power flow in third and fourth gears. Hydromatic is so designed that in third and fourth gears, 60% of the engine's power is transmitted by direct mechanical drive. Only 40% of the engine's power is transmitted by the fluid coupling. This prevents power loss and slippage at normal highway speeds. Competitive automatic drives do not have this divided power flow feature. Yes, in Hydromatic, you have many features of performance and economy to sell that are not available in other automatic drives. And in addition, Nash salesmen will have an outstanding convenience feature to sell that even other users of Hydromatic do not have. This feature that only Nash has is a completely new, a vastly more convenient method of engine starting. In Nash with Hydromatic, the engine is started by merely setting the selector to N or neutral, then lifting it. While in all other makes using Hydromatic, after the selector is set at N, the engine must be started by pushing a button on the instrument panel. This new improved method of engine starting on Nash is a feature that will have real sales appeal. Because today, car buyers want and are looking for more and better conveniences. Nash, America's most modern car, again is ahead of the field in giving car buyers what they want. This new, more convenient method of starting is another example of the advanced modern engineering that is to be found in every major feature of Nash. Remember that Nash chose Hydromatic Drive for the Ambassador because it is the best automatic transmission with the greatest all-around advantages. Nash with Hydromatic. What a combination. The best drive on any car and the best car to drive. Hydromatic drive is a feature that cannot be properly shown in the sales room. It will be completely new to many prospects who must experience its marvelous advantages for themselves. Chambassador together are an entirely new combination for everyone. They can both be shown to best advantage on a road demonstration. So let's try out the new Ambassador with Hydromatic by ourselves first to be sure we're ready to make a good demonstration to prospects. As in any road demonstration, we should have a planned route, mapped out to include some traffic, hills, and a stretch of open highway. Then, with the demonstrator in perfect mechanical condition, and be sure that this includes perfect adjustment of the engine idling speed, we're all set for a trial run. We'll call attention to the advantages that should be shown to prospects. This would be a good time to point out that there is no clutch pedal which is one of the biggest conveniences of Hydromatic, because working the clutch pedal requires a great deal of effort. Besides, once the engine has been started and the selector placed at D, only one motion is required to get the car underway and into high gear, stepping on the gas. 
To get into high with a conventional transmission, however, 14 motions are required. Depressing the clutch, shifting, releasing the clutch, stepping on the gas and off again and so forth for each gear. When we first try the hydromatic drive, we should be sure to give it the gas carefully. Everyone should be cautioned not to tramp down hard on the accelerator as the great surge of power from the Ambassador engine, efficiently transmitted by hydromatic to the rear wheels, gives the car a surprisingly fast getaway. This caution is especially important because some people are in the habit of gunning the engine while the car is stopped. With an ordinary clutch and transmission, this just wastes gas. But with hydromatic, the car will really take off. It takes a little while to get used to the fact that the gas pedal alone will start the car moving. Then, as we slow down for a traffic light, note that the shifts are automatically made downward. Incidentally, in downshifting, the transmission doesn't go into second, but skips from third to first. Also, the engine provides braking action down to about 15 miles an hour. This keeps the car under good control and prolongs the life of the brake lining. While we are stopped is a good time to point out that the car does not creep ahead. And then, in starting again, we can demonstrate the control that the driver has over the rate of acceleration by pressing down hard or easy on the gas pedal. On the highway, there are features to be demonstrated too. For example, going uphill, Hydromatic will make an automatic downshift into third if the car slows down enough. And it will shift back into high when the car picks up sufficient speed again. And for extra braking action by the engine, the selector can be moved to the L position at any speed under 40 miles an hour. With the selector at L, the transmission will not shift into third as the car gains speed. It will remain in first or second gear. Now, after we've become thoroughly familiar with the operation of the hydromatic drive ourselves, we're ready to present and to demonstrate it to prospects. In presenting and demonstrating Hydromatic, remember this. Its greatest appeal is its convenience, the fact that it permits effortless driving. Men will like it, of course, but its greatest appeal will be to women. So stress all its convenience features, particularly to the wife. If possible, have her try it. If she's not present, remind her husband of how much his wife will like it. Use this you'll find it a strong lever to make sales. During any demonstration ride, we should interpret hydromatic in terms of the basic buying appeal. Comfort and convenience from the smooth action of the fluid coupling, the complete elimination of clutching, the automatic shifting, and the effortless driving that reduces fatigue. Safety and performance are improved because of the car's fast acceleration, especially with the downshift from fourth to third which makes possible the quick and safe passing of cars. There's economy too, but we'll get into that a little later. After we've demonstrated the Ambassador with Hydromatic and have sold its advantages to the prospect, we should be ready to answer questions and handle any objections that might come up like this. It's uh, quite an improvement, all right, but it seemed to me that the engine speeded up when you stepped on the gas. Is it supposed to do that? I can understand how you might get that impression, Mr. Cobb. Actually, however, the engine speeds up only a little more than with a conventional transmission. Naturally, in hydromatic, with the car constantly in gear, there must be a slight speeding up of the engine to get the car moving. I believe you notice it because you're not used to the smooth, quiet application of power which you get with hydromatic. It has been our experience that everyone who drives hydromatic completely loses this impression after two or three days. After you drive the new Ambassador for a day or so, you'll never think of it again. You'll be so pleased with its better performance. That's been the experience of everyone who has used hydromatic drive. Maybe so. Uh, another thing, I've heard a great deal about fluid drive. How does hydromatic compare with it? Well, they're both good drives, Mr. Cobb, but hydromatic is superior, and for these reasons. In the first place, we have no clutch pedal because there's no need for it. But in fluid drive, there is a pedal and it does have to be used to get the car in motion after the engine is started. Then too, in hydromatic, the shifting is completely automatic. 
the driver only has to hold his foot on the accelerator. In fluid drive, you have to lift your foot from the pedal to make each shift, and the shifts are not as smooth. So you see, our drive is much more convenient, and it's much more efficient too, giving you better economy. Here's why. When Hydromatic is in third or fourth gear, only 40% of the power goes through the fluid coupling, and 60% of it is mechanically transmitted. The result is that there's practically no slip in our fluid coupling at normal driving speeds, and therefore, no loss of power. In fluid drive, all of the engine's power is transmitted by their fluid coupling, so that there's more slip and loss of power. Another hydromatic advantage is this. In first and third speeds, the part of the fluid coupling that is driven by the engine is geared down so that it runs at only seven-tenths of the engine speed. That reduces the possibility of creeping when the car is stopped with the engine idling. In fluid drive, the coupling runs at the same speed as the engine. It turns faster and therefore has a greater tendency to make the car creep forward. Because of Hydromatic's exclusive divided power flow design, our fluid coupling is much more efficient than that of fluid drive, giving you better economy by more efficient transmission of the engine's power. By actual test, the slip in Hydromatic's fluid coupling at normal driving speed is considerably less than a half of 1%, whereas in fluid drive, it runs around 4 to 5%. Less slip in the Hydromatic means more useful power and better economy. Now let's compare performance. In Hydromatic, the automatic shifting covers the whole range of four gears. In fluid drive, the car shifts only between third and fourth gears in normal driving. When the car is stopped, Hydromatic drops into low gear that gives you all the power of first gear for a powerful start under any conditions in traffic going uphill anywhere. In fluid drive, when the car is stopped, the transmission doesn't shift into low gear, but only into third. And you know the great difference in pulling power between third and first gear. So obviously, fluid drive's gear ratio is not as good as hydromatics for getting started, especially going uphill. Another thing, we have a built-in parking brake that puts a positive lock on the rear wheels. If the selector is placed at R for reverse, when the car is parked, the rear wheels are locked so they can't move. Fluid drive does not have this feature. So you see, Mr. Cobb, Hydromatic gives you greater convenience, better economy, and superior performance compared to fluid drive. Well, uh, what about Dynaflow? How does Hydromatic compare with that? Hydromatic is also superior to Dynaflow and for practically the same reasons that I just pointed out. In Dynaflow, as with fluid drive, there's a tendency for the car to creep forward when stopped with the engine running because its fluid coupling is driven at engine speed. In Hydromatic, you'll remember, the coupling turns at only seven-tenths of engine speed. Also, you'll recall that Hydromatic has a high efficiency in transmitting power from the engine to the rear wheels because 60% of the power is carried by mechanical means and only 40% through the fluid coupling. In Dynaflow, all the engine's power has to be transmitted through their fluid coupling with a much greater slip and loss of power. This wastes gas and costs money because you get fewer miles per gallon. Dynaflow's inefficiency is admittedly a part of its design because it has a radiator for getting rid of the excess heat generated in the fluid. This wasted heat means wasted power and wasted gas. There is no such radiator on the hydromatic because there is no excess heat to get rid of. Now as to gas economy. Hydromatic in city driving gives several miles more per gallon than Dynaflow and in country driving Hydromatic's gas economy over Dynaflow is even better. In performance, Dynaflow's lowest ratio with the car standing still is only 2.25 to 1. The engine's power is not geared down for hard pulling and fast pickup the way it is with Hydromatic's 3.82 to 1 reduction in low gear. 
And what's more, Dynaflow's ratio drops rapidly as the car picks up speed, and it cannot be controlled by the driver. Its highest possible ratio at 40 miles an hour is only 1.1 to 1, whereas with Hydromatic, the driver can maintain a ratio of 1.45 to 1 in third gear, up to more than 60 miles an hour. With Hydromatic, you are assured of dependable performance too. Our drive has been in continuous use since 1939, completely proved as satisfactory in the hands of over a million owners. Besides, it was installed on tanks in the last war because it was rugged and dependable and an efficient way to transmit the engine's power. Hydromatic's performance has been proved by experience. But Dynaflow is a recent development, first introduced in 1948 and has been used on only one make of car. You say uh, Hydromatic is superior to the other fluid arrangements. Uh, how about a regular three-speed transmission with overdrive? How does Hydromatic compare with that? Well, we have both types, Mr. Cobb, so I can give you a very complete comparison of the Hydromatic with the regular three-speed transmission and overdrive on our Ambassador. Let us first consider overdrive. Actually, overdrive is an automatic fourth speed. When the car is in third gear, and your speed is about 25 miles per hour, you merely let up on the accelerator, and the transmission automatically shifts into overdrive. Immediately, the engine runs about 20% slower to produce any given speed. That means you use less gas and oil, and it, of course, means considerably less wear on the motor. So, overdrive saves you money. In fact, for country highway driving, there is no transmission so economical as overdrive. And in case you need a spurt of power or speed, you simply press the accelerator to the floor and the car automatically goes into third gear. That is not only convenient, but is a great safety feature as well. So, to sum up overdrive, it gives big savings in highway driving and also has some of the convenience of automatic shifting. Now let us compare hydromatic. Of course, since there are no gears or clutch to operate, Hydromatic is much more convenient and less tiring than either overdrive or a standard transmission. Remember, Hydromatic selects the proper gear for the speed of the car or the power needed for the engine. You saw what a great convenience that is, particularly in city traffic. And in addition, just as with overdrive, when you needed an extra spurt of speed or power, you shifted from fourth to third gear simply by pushing the accelerator all the way down. There are many times when you want that kind of fast pickup. It certainly is easy to operate, but uh, how do hydromatic and overdrive compare on gas mileage? Under some conditions, Mr. Cobb, overdrive does give better gas mileage, but hydromatic gives the best gas mileage of all the fully automatic drives. And this is because it is more efficient. As I have already pointed out, Hydromatic not only uses a fluid clutch, but also direct mechanical drive, and that prevents slippage, which is the main cause for poor gas mileage. Well, I've heard that these automatic transmissions don't give you engine braking on hills. How about that? That's a good point, and I'm glad you mentioned it. For Hydromatic is safe on hills. If you want to use your engine for braking, you just move the selector over to L, and in this position, the transmission is held in first or second gear, depending upon the speed of the car. So you have the same kind of control as with a standard transmission. The Hydromatic is truly a wonderful feature, Mr. Cobb, and in comparing it with overdrive, I believe that the kind of driving you do most will help you decide which you prefer. Is most of your driving done in city traffic or on country highways? Nearly all of it in city traffic. Then you certainly will want the Hydromatic drive. For once you get used to the ease of handling your car in city traffic with Hydromatic, I know we'll never be able to get it away from you. And so this salesman was able to give a good sales presentation of the Ambassador with Hydromatic because he followed certain basic steps in selling it. By studying the features of the Hydromatic drive, by thoroughly familiarizing himself with its operation on a planned demonstration route, by giving his prospect a complete demonstration 
and by intelligently handling the questions and objections which arise, every Nash salesman can place himself in a choice position to take advantage of the public's great interest in automatic drives. Hydromatic is the best drive in any car. And when you add its proven advantages and superiority to the already great appeal of the Ambassador, with the Ambassador's own superior qualities of convenience, safety, economy, and performance, you have in the Nash Ambassador with Hydromatic a combination of buying appeals that only Nash salesmen can offer. We want you to meet Jim Fulton. Jim has been selling Nash cars for about six months and he's beginning to do all right. And he deserves to because he's put in a lot of hard work. For example, Jim has spent a lot of time learning his product sales story. In fact, he's studying his data book now. But he looks puzzled. Let's see what's troubling him. Say, Jim. Huh? We can see you're smoothing up your product story, but you look puzzled. What's troubling you? Well, it's this aerodynamic story. It's mighty interesting, and it seems to have all the points for a powerful sales story. But somehow, I can't seem to explain it so that my prospects understand it. Jim, it is a great story. In fact, a terrific story. One that can help you close plenty of sales. Let's go into the sales room a minute. Maybe we can straighten this story out for you. Well, I sure hope so. Now, take a good look at this poster. It tells the story of what our air flight aerodynamic styling means to Nash automobiles. First, more than 20% less air drag than the average of competitive cars is just like adding more power to Nash engines. Less air drag also means much better gasoline economy. It means better roadability at high speeds and therefore a safer car. Finally, less air drag means a quiet car. Less wind roar at all speeds. Now, when you have definite advantages like these, Jim, doesn't it make a great sales story? Won't talking points like these help close sales? Sure, and I've tried to use them, but I just can't seem to put them across. You see, I can't explain just why or how these things happened, all right? Let's dig into this aerodynamic story. Let's find out what it's all about and learn it in a way that we can use with prospects. We'll start right at the beginning and see what happens when air is in action. First, let's take a look at a pleasant everyday sight. The wind whistles around a street corner. And we have a demonstration of an interesting fact. We mean, of course, the fact that air has substance. When it moves, as wind, it exerts force on objects in its path. That young lady's skirt, for example. But Air also offers resistance to objects moving through it. As a matter of fact, aerodynamics is the scientific study of the resistance of air to a body moving through it. If you've ever ridden a bicycle, you probably remember that the faster you rode, the more wind resistance you encountered, and the harder you had to pedal. That was true whether the day was calm or windy. Of course, if you were going against a real strong wind, you really had to bear down on the pedals. Well, it's just the same with automobiles. But because automobiles travel at higher speeds, the resistance of the air or wind is much greater. And this fact is most important. Engine horsepower must be used to overcome this wind resistance. And using more horsepower means consuming more gasoline. Automobile engineers have long known this. In fact, over the years, they've tried to improve their designs and produce what we have long called a streamlined body. But unfortunately, automobile engineers have had no method of actually testing their designs to determine how much wind resistance a car had to overcome or whether they were, in fact, improving their designs. This was the situation in 1948 when Nash was testing its revolutionary air flight models. Of course, Nash engineers had used all their knowledge to make the air flights the most streamlined cars yet developed. As they made their proving ground tests, 
Nash engineers found that these sleek new designs were giving better high-speed performance than had been expected. Of course, they wanted to know why. And after much checking, they decided there could be only one answer. This new car had less wind resistance. It was using less horsepower to attain given speeds. To further prove this, the engineers installed a 48 engine in the new 49 car. In the air flight design, the 48 engine gave a top speed of seven miles per hour more than it had in the 48 body. This was positive proof that the air flight body had less wind resistance. But it also raised many questions. Questions such as these. How and why did the air flight body have less air resistance than previous models? How did it compare with competitive cars? And how could they, the engineers, find out? Well, fortunately, the answers to these questions were to be found in the Aeronautical Engineering Department of the University of Wichita in Kansas. Here, there had recently been built a new wind tunnel, a wind tunnel large enough to test full-size automobiles. So, Nash became the first automotive manufacturer ever to investigate the science of streamlining by actual wind tunnel tests of full-size cars. Furthermore, it was to be a most thorough investigation. Nash was to be compared with all its principal competitors. So to Wichita there were sent not only Nash cars, but a whole fleet of competitive cars, a fleet which represented almost every current body design. Each of these cars was set up in turn in the wind tunnel under identical conditions. Inside the tunnel, this giant propeller developed airflow speeds of from 30 to 85 miles per hour. The tests were made with the most modern scientific aerodynamic instruments, which collected accurate data on air velocity, static pressure, and velocity pressure at strategic locations. This information was recorded on meters in the control room, where it was photographed for scientific analysis and comparison. These tests revealed some startling information. First, the wind tunnel tests prove that overcoming air resistance requires a high percentage of an automobile's horsepower. The test showed that at about 40 miles per hour, almost half the power required to drive the average car is used to overcome air resistance. And at 60 miles per hour, almost 60% of the total required horsepower is used to overcome air resistance. Of course, this means the more air resistance a car creates while moving through the air, the more gasoline it consumes in overcoming that resistance. Second, the wind tunnel test showed that air resistance does not act in a car the way most of us have always thought it did. One would naturally think that nearly all air resistance would develop around the front end, the radiator and windshield. And to be sure, resistance does develop there and the shape of the front end, the position of the grill openings, does influence the total amount of air resistance. But let's examine more closely just what does happen. As the car thrusts forward, the air splits and flows over, under, and by the sides of the car. And here's the surprising thing. A great amount of air resistance develops at the rear of the car. This happens because the air becomes extremely agitated or turbulent starting at the point where the wind breaks away from the car. This turbulence, plus the forward motion of the car, leaves a sort of hole in the air behind it. This hole is a partial vacuum, and the surrounding air is sucked in to fill it. The result is that as the car speeds forward, it is constantly pulling a mass of turbulent air along behind it. As a direct demonstration, of this sucking action created by a body moving through the air, we've seen papers and rubbish rise and whirl crazily in the wake of a fast-moving bus or train. Because this turbulence of the air acts like a giant dragging behind the car, it is known as air drag, and drag is a good name for it. Now, the amount of air drag on cars of the same size depends on the point where the wind stream breaks away from the surface of the car. The location of this breakaway point is an important factor in the aerodynamic efficiency of any car. 
For example, an airplane wing has very low air drag. Notice that the air displaced at the front flows smoothly along the top and bottom of the wing and flows off smoothly at the rear with practically no turbulence and therefore practically no drag. One of the competitive cars tested at Wichita was the so-called notchback design. And as you might now expect, it has considerable air drag. The air flows along the car top until it reaches the abrupt drop in the body, the notch. Then it becomes turbulent. The point at which the air flow breaks is well forward on the car. So a large mass of turbulent air is created and a heavy drag is exerted on the car. Surprisingly enough, this so-called fast taper back didn't do so well either. It looks like a good job of streamlining, but notice that the top line starts dropping near the middle of the car roof and falls away rapidly. The smooth flow of air is broken up where that taper begins. As a result, the drag effect starts at the halfway mark and continues all the way back, and that means a large amount of drag. In contrast, let's look at our Nash Air Flight. The air flows smoothly over the top all the way to a point about a third of the way down the trunk lid. Therefore, only a small mass of turbulent air is created, and so much less drag is exerted. By comparing these designs, you can easily see how Nash develops a much smaller mass of turbulence, and therefore much less air drag. Now, and remember this, the roof line from the windshield to the rear bumper is an important factor in giving Nash its aerodynamic superiority over all the cars tested. And in addition, the enclosed fenders, particularly at the front, the clean lines of the body sides, the relatively smooth undersides, all played a part in making Nash the car with the least air drag. Well, now, Jim, does that answer some of your questions about aerodynamics? It sure does, but I've got some more. All right, let's have them. Well, you say this means savings in gasoline and horsepower, but exactly how big is our advantage over competition? Fair enough, Jim. And here are facts, facts that give you a big advantage over competition, facts that will help you close sales. Listen to them. Remember them. Tell your prospects this, for instance. At 60 miles an hour, competitive cars require, on an average, over four horsepower more than Nash to overcome air resistance. At 80 miles an hour, competitive cars require, on an average, over 10 horsepower more than Nash to overcome air resistance. In fact, at any speed, from 30 miles per hour on up, every car tested required more horsepower than Nash to overcome air resistance. And at any speed, Nash is over 20% more efficient than the average of other cars. Yes, 20%. But remember, that's the average. The superiority of Nash is much greater when compared to certain competitive makes. For instance, at 80 miles an hour, a Nash actually maintains its speed with 21 less horsepower than car I, which had the poorest aerodynamic design of all cars tested. Well, that's darn good selling information. But exactly what does all this mean in terms of the advantages on this chart? What are the facts about added power, fuel economy, safety and stability, and less wind roar? Good questions, Jim. So let's go over these four plus values in a little more detail. And incidentally, your new pocket folder on aerodynamics tells this story in very handy form. It's a fine sales tool for use with your prospects. All right. Plus value number one. The air flight body's 20% less air drag is just like adding more horsepower to Nash engines. This means that the famous economy engines of Nash give the performance of engines with much higher horsepower. Plus value number two. A Nash requires less gasoline to maintain highway speeds than any other full-size American car. And our air flight aerodynamic design has a lot to do with that. And if you want further proof, Remember this, the high gasoline mileage of our economical Nash engine, if installed in any of the competitive cars tested, would be reduced up to five miles per gallon. This is because the average car tested has much greater air drag than the air flight. 
plus value number three. Nash aerodynamic styling means better road ability and steering stability. Here's another dramatic fact proved in the wind tunnel tests. Take this car, in which the side air streams break sharply across the rear of the car, creating forces, first on one side and then on the other, that actually move the rear of the car sidewise. In the high-speed tests, the rear of this particular car rocked so violently, fishtailed so to speak, that the car had to be removed from the test equipment. This car is not stable at high speeds on the road. In a Nash, you do not get back end sway, and you can prove that to yourself by riding in the back seat of a fast traveling Nash air flight. Finally, plus value number four. In a Nash air flight, wind noises are hushed to a whisper. This is a value you can prove to yourself and to your prospects. Take an air flight out on the highway where you can open it up. You will hear the difference all right. Your ears will tell you that the wind is not noisily whipping around the car. Now to sum up the facts. Nash aerodynamic styling adds four plus values to your Nash sales story. Greater performance, increased economy, improved road ability, and quieter running. Proved facts which make you the Nash salesman, the only salesman who can prove to your prospects that your car has true aerodynamic styling. Design that will save the customer money when he drives an Ash will give him greater riding pleasure, comfort, and safety. And now, Jim, do you think you understand the story on aerodynamics? Understand it well enough so that you can use it with your prospects and make it a real help in closing sales? Yes, sir. You just watch me. All right, Jim Fulton. We'll give you an opportunity on the other side of the record. All right, Jim Fulton, now you know what Nash aerodynamic styling is and what it means to the Nash owner on the highway. Yes, sir, and I had no idea it was such a great story. It's that all right, but now, how are you going to use it? How am I going to use it? Oh, what do you mean? Well, I mean, how are you going to work it into your present sales story? Remember, here is a new selling feature that gives you another big edge on competition. It can really help you close sales if you use it in the best way. Yeah? I guess you're right, and maybe I am going off half-cocked. Well, do you have any suggestions? Well, how about this for a start? What prospect buying appeals does the aerodynamic story most naturally tie in with or support? Prospect buying appeals? You mean, uh, well, just what do you mean anyway? <laughs> you know them, Jim. You're just a little embarrassed because I'm putting you on the spot. Here they are. Remember? Style and beauty. Comfort convenience, safety, economy, and performance. Now, when you check these appeals, you find that our aerodynamic story ties in with and supports five of them, like this. Style and beauty. The air flight design, with less air resistance than any other full-size car, also has smooth, flowing lines that are nice to look at. Comfort. Less wind roar and better road ability mean a car that's more comfortable, less tiring, easier to handle. Safety. Less air resistance, particularly at high speeds, greatly reduces rear end sway, making the Nash Air Flight more stable and easier to handle. Economy. Less air drag reduces the horsepower needed to produce a given speed. Using less horsepower means more miles from each gallon of gasoline. Performance. Less air drag is like adding more power to Nash engines. You get the famous Nash economy and also the pickup and speed of a much higher powered engine. Now do you see what I mean? Yeah. That aerodynamic story can be used to build up and make each of those five appeals stronger. It can help you create a stronger desire in your prospects to own a Nash air flight. Oh, I see what you mean now. You've really got something there. Indeed we have, Jim. Now, let's do some practicing, just to see how well you can work this aerodynamic advantage into your sales story. Let's dream up an imaginary prospect for you to work on right here on the sales floor. Here he is, a young man, fairly prosperous looking. We'll call him Mr. Walker. So let's see what you do, Jim Fulton, when Mr. Walker gives you an opening like this. 
Sure is a smooth-looking job. Well, I'm certainly glad you like the looks of our air flight, Mr. Walker, because naturally we think it's the most beautiful car on the road. But the nicest thing about it, and the most important, is this. That beauty is more than skin deep. There's a very practical reason for those smooth, tapering lines. A uh, practical reason? What do you mean? Well, just this. The shape of the air flight body gives you far more than beauty. That beautiful body design helps to give you better performance, better gasoline economy, a safer, more stable car, and a quieter car. Now, wait a minute. That's a little hard to swallow. Yes, it is hard to believe, but it's a fact, Mr. Walker, proved by scientific comparison with other cars. You see, the air flight body has less resistance to air, 20% less than the average modern automobile. 20%? That sounds like a lot. Well, it's true, though. And here are the facts, proved by aeronautical engineers at the University of Wichita. Good enough, Jim. You got into your aerodynamic story very smoothly with that prospect. Let's let Mr. Walker go now. He was pretty easy. Because he liked the looks of our Nash, and he said so. But all your prospects won't be so easy. So let's practice on another imaginary prospect. A Mrs. Riggs. Now, you've got some selling to do here, because she's typical of those people who aren't able to make up their minds. So let's assume that you've given her quite a complete story, and that you've done a good job explaining all the features inside and out, and demonstrating the car on the road. Of course, she likes the car, but she finally says... I think it's a very nice automobile, Mr. Fulton, but I can't quite decide whether I like the looks of it or not. It's certainly streamlined, but yet I don't know. Mrs. Riggs, I can easily understand how you feel. I think it's always a little hard to get used to something new, but I think I can promise you that this Nash Air Flight will grow on you. The longer you have it, the more you'll like it. That's been our experience with customers who felt just as you do. Many of them have come back after they've had their car a week or a month or so and told us they think it's the most beautiful car on the road. Is that so? Yes, and uh, we believe there's a good reason for it. You see, the Nash Air Flight has what the art people call functional styling. Oh, I see. And in just what way does this car have functional styling, Mr. Fulton? Well, it's designed to do the job it's supposed to do more efficiently than any other car, Mrs. Riggs. Now, of course, the job of a car is to move forward through the air. But air has substance. It resists that movement. And you'll be amazed at how great that resistance is and what it means to the performance of a car. Nash engineers have had impartial scientific tests made by aeronautical engineers in the wind tunnel at the University of Wichita. These were comparative tests because they were made not only on Nash cars, but also on 10 leading competitive makes. The results of these tests are summed up in this folder, Mrs. Riggs. These results have proved conclusively that the Nash air flight styling does perform a useful function. It's over 20% more efficient at the job of moving forward through the air than the average of other modern cars. And here's why Nash is superior, Mrs. Riggs, and just what it means to you. Hold it, Jim. Hold it right there while we let Mrs. Riggs go. She's served her purpose. And you did a good job of working in your aerodynamic story to support your sales talk on style and beauty. <laughs> well, uh, what's so funny? <laughs> Functional styling. Where'd you get that fancy spiel, Jim? <laughs> Something I saw in a magazine, I guess. I thought it might work pretty good on a clothes horse like Mrs. Riggs. Oh, you're quite right, too. It's perfectly true and a good sales angle. But let's get back to business. You've pretty well covered the situations where you can use our aerodynamic story to support style and beauty. Now let's try a couple more. Here comes another imaginary prospect. Informal looking gent, Bud Ransom by name. Let's assume that Bud is a sports-minded fellow. He's chained to his job in town all week, but comes Friday night, is off of the North Country in some hunting or fishing, or whatever happens to be in season. He piles up five or six hundred miles every weekend that he can get away. And, of course, he wants a car that can get up and go. Well, this baby's got a lot of things I like. That bed arrangement's the nuts. But, frankly, the way I run around on weekends, I need a car that can get out on the highway and do some fancy stepping. I think maybe I ought to have more horsepower than your car's got. Mr. Ransom, I'm glad you mentioned that point, because if you want high-speed performance, you've come to the right place. 
This ambassador is a real stepper. Uh, could be. But it stands to reason that this job with 115 horsepower isn't going to have the steam that the Pilgrim 8 has with 128 horsepower. Uh, yes, Mr. Ransom, that's a natural thing to think. But engineers are learning a lot of things about automobile performance. They know, for example, that horsepower rating is only one factor in creating good performance. Take uh, overall weight, for instance. The lighter a car is, the less power it needs for good performance. And our unitized air flight construction has made it possible for Nash to build a car that's almost 400 pounds lighter than the Pilgrim. That gives us a higher ratio of horsepower to weight. Now here's something else. Engineers have discovered that the amount of air resistance a car develops has a great deal to do with the way the car performs, especially at high speeds. Air resistance? Yes, sir. It's a big factor in performance. In fact, at 80 miles an hour, two-thirds of a car's horsepower is used to overcome air resistance alone. Is that a fact? Yes, indeed. A fact proved in scientific wind tunnel tests. This is something you'll be interested in. Let me show you some of the results of these tests. What they mean in terms of performance and economy and safer handling. And then, if you like, We'll climb into a demonstrator and you'll be able to see for yourself what wonderful performance the ambassador gives on the open road. Sold. Jim, you put a lot of punch into that presentation and slanted it right down Bud Ransom's alley. Now let's practice on one more imaginary prospect. Let's think of this prospect as, oh, maybe a purchasing agent or an accountant. Anyway, he's the kind of fellow who wants facts and figures. He's got to be shown. Let's call him Wiggins. And perhaps he gives you a lead like this. I notice you people have been claiming 25 miles to the gallon at average highway speeds. How can you possibly get that kind of mileage in a big car like this? Now, Jim, of course that's your cue to rub your hands and sail into your economy story, one of the most powerful selling features you have. You tell them about that great statesman engine with its Uniflow jet carburation and sealed-in manifolding and all the rest. And you tell them how air flight construction is lighter, and therefore requires less power and gasoline to move it. But how do you go on from there? Well, now, of course, Mr. Wiggins, our high compression engine with Uniflow jet carburation and our lightweight air flight construction are big factors in the outstanding gasoline economy of the Nash Statesman. But there's another important factor that you may not know about. And what's that? The fact that Nash Air Flight Design offers less air resistance. Air resistance? I wouldn't think that would have much to do with gas mileage. Well, most people don't realize what a big factor air resistance is, Mr. Wiggins. But it is important, and becomes more important the faster you go. Why, at 60 miles per hour, almost 60% of the horsepower used goes to overcome air resistance. This and other facts were discovered as the result of impartial wind tunnel tests made by the Aeronautical Department at the University of Wichita. Tests made on Nash and the 10 other leading competitive makes. The engineers found that the Nash air flight has 20% less air drag than the average car today. Now, as an example of what that means in gasoline economy, it's been computed that one of our Nash engines installed in one of these competitive cars would get up to five miles less per gallon than it does in the air flight. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, just how does that happen? Well, Mr. Wiggins, I think I can answer that question for you with the help of this folder. You see... Okay, Jim. We can let the imaginary Mr. Wiggins go now. I think you know your story. Do you feel that this practice session has done you some good? It sure has. I feel a lot more confident now. Fine. Now that you know your story, I know that you'll use it with every prospect. And just in case you hadn't noticed, there are two likely-looking prospects coming in the door now. Let's see you go to work. Okay. Uh, give me the pitch on this pair. Where do you want me to start? Start from the beginning, Jim. This time you've got real prospects on your hands. Real prospects? The buying kind? Man, watch me go to work. <laughs> Hey, there.
there's a car that makes sense to me. That's my kind of car. Wait till the girls see me in that car. It's so, so modern looking. I can see right now, that's my kind of car. You're right, George. That's just a size car we need for our family. Yeah, and it's, it's right for our bank account, too. In fact, that's our kind of car. Yes, when a man or, of course, a woman meets the car that's obviously right for him. The car that fits his needs and his tastes exactly. There's immediate certain recognition. And that thrill of finding the motor car that's exactly right is happening to more people today. For today, there is a car that's different, a brand new type of car. The Nash Rambler Lando, the newest member of the distinguished Nash Air Flight family. The car that's a part of tomorrow, a big part of the better tomorrow that Nash has pledged in the words, there's much of tomorrow in all Nash does today. But why is this beauty a new type of car? First, the Rambler is a compact car, wheelbase and even 100 inches, overall length 176 inches. For any 100-pound woman who has tried to jockey two tons of automobile into a curbside parking space, for any driver who has wondered why he should have to sweat a big sprawling mass of sheet metal through close-packed traffic, for anybody who has wanted a nimble car in traffic, a fast-footed, get-up-and-go kind of car, well, this is my kind of car. The Rambler seats five people, big people, and gives them more seating room and greater comfort than many cars give to the six passengers for which they are designed. For the millions of smaller families who want room for occasional extra passengers but do not want to pay heavily for it in money and in the inconvenience of a big, cumbersome car, this is our kind of car. The Rambler is a high-performance car. Its acceleration will leave heavy cars still fumbling through their gears. Its open road cruising speeds are scaled high to fit the far-stretching miles of American highways. In riding comfort and ruggedness, it is built for the vast distances and varied road conditions of our American land. The Rambler Lando is a new kind of convertible. New because it's a convertible with the comfort and safety of a sedan. For the young in years and the young in heart, for those who can thrill to the sky and the stars above them, this is my kind of car. The Nash Rambler Lando, the luxury sportster, sells in the lowest price class. Yes, completely custom equipped, it sells for less money than any other full-size standard make convertible. And that's news that'll make us all say, that's our kind of car. But let's get some details on this new type automobile. The Rambler Lando is the first convertible type motor car that's as strong and solid as a closed model. It's the safest convertible ever built. In all other convertibles, whether the top is up or down, there are no structural members higher than the lower line of the windows. The passengers are unprotected above that danger line. Neither is there anything above that line to brace the body against sidewise twisting. Therefore, the separate chassis frames of all other convertibles must be reinforced and strengthened by various methods, all of which add excess weight, up to 200 pounds or more. But even this reinforcing does not stiffen the body and frame sufficiently. So, every other convertible body, bolted to its heavy reinforced chassis frame, is twisted and shaken so that rattles occur and window openings cannot be sealed against the weather. Now, let's look at the Rambler. As in the rest of the Nash family, the Rambler body and frame are of air flight construction, in which all members reinforce each other. They are a bridge-like framework of steel girders, one rock-solid unit, giving tremendous overall rigidity to the entire structure. In addition, the sheet metal skin is welded to the girder-built framework, so that the body metal strengthens and stiffens the framework, as well as enclosing the body. All this, of course, is basic Nash Air Flight construction. Unitized body and frame, the most advanced design in bodybuilding today, and an exclusive Nash advantage. However, in any closed car, the steel top provides a great deal of rigidity and strength to the whole body structure. To replace this strengthening roof, Nash developed a brand new structural principle for the Rambler Lando. Strong, rigid steel girders run from front to rear of the car just above the windows. They are braced at the midsection by strong vertical columns. 
The side girders with their reinforcements join the crosswise body members above the windshield to the members in the lower rear of the body. Together they form a rigid box section structure that makes the Rambler Lando the strongest, most rigid convertible built in America today. As one result of this engineering advance, passengers ride protected on all sides by heavy steel beams. The Rambler Lando is the safest convertible on any highway today. As a second result, doors and windows are fitted, top and sides, against rigid body members. In all other convertibles, of course, doors are not completely supported and windows fit against a folding top, an invitation to rattles and leaks. Furthermore, the conventional top mechanism, with its cumbersome mass of arms and levers, breeding rattles at every joint, is completely absent from the Rambler Lando. Instead, as a third result of the Rambler's construction, the top with its supporting bows slides on channels in the structural side rails. The top folds itself as it goes, until it recesses smoothly into a compartment behind the back seat. Power is provided through nylon-covered steel cables moved by an electrically powered drum. With the top either up or down, the Rambler looks as new styled as it is. The smooth flowing body lines and the concealed front wheels proudly proclaim it a Nash. And the big curved one-piece windshield increases eye appeal as well as safety. At the sides of the cowl, vents furnish an accent in design as well as supplying additional ventilation to the engine compartment. From the rear, the low trim lines of the Rambler are particularly distinctive. And the big rear window is an important safety advance, giving far broader vision to the rear than in old style convertibles. On hot summer days, the entire rear window panel can be opened to permit additional circulation of air. Inside the car, there's luxurious roominess, almost unbelievable roominess considering the compact look of the car from outside, because the Rambler was designed to be roomy. Most of its overall length is devoted to the comfortable housing of its passengers. As to leg room, well, maybe that's what this chap's wondering about. His height, six feet, two inches. But even he has plenty of room for leg stretching. Actually, he's enjoying more leg room than he'd have in many a conventional size sedan. And there's plenty of headroom, too. Here's the front seat of the Rambler. It looks big, and it is big. A full 58 and a half inches wide. Ample room for three big people, even on long drives. Furthermore, the Rambler front seat is divided to fit the three persons for whom it is designed. Nobody has to lean against the division in the seat back. In addition, that seat, like the rear seat, is foam rubber, a comfort feature which is standard equipment on every Rambler Lando. The rear seat of the Rambler is designed for two people, and they'll be comfortable in it. Since there's considerably more seating room per person, than in the rear seat of the average sedan built to seat three people. That roomy interior is both modern and luxurious in its styling. For instance, the brand new design of steering wheel and instrument panel catches the eye at a glance. Steering wheel, gear shift lever, and directional signal control all seem part of the instrument panel. It's smart styling and the most convenient grouping. Directly before the driver's eyes are the instruments. In a uniscope mounting, hooded to prevent reflected images. Instead of the traditional oil pressure gauge, dangerously easy to ignore, there's a red light which flashes an urgent warning to the driver if the oil pressure falls below a safe point. Midway of the panel, there are the man-sized controls of a brand new radio designed especially for this car. And below them, the controls of a redesigned weather eye, featuring a water shedder more efficient than ever before. The upholstery is a custom quality two-tone needlepoint fabric. The body hardware, door and window handles, ash receivers and all the rest have the rich restrained elegance of the finest custom design. To sum it up, the Rambler Lando is custom equipped and trimmed as befits the fine quality car it is. It was not stripped to meet a price. It was designed to be complete at its price. Under the Rambler's hood, is the famous Flying Scott engine, proved in more than nine billion miles of highway performance in the Nash 600. And in a car of the Rambler's weight, that engine's power means sparkling performance, 
at the traffic lights, on the hills, on the open highway. This performance is assisted materially by the fact that air drag is less for the Rambler Lando than for even the Nash Ambassador and Statesman. This, of course, is due to the smaller overall dimensions of the Rambler. In operating economy, the Nash Flying Scott engine stands alone. It is the engine which has consistently racked up records of 25 miles per gallon and more, even in a heavier car. It is an engine which profits from such exclusive economy features as Nash sealed-in manifolding. Furthermore, in the Rambler, the exclusive Nash principle of Uniflow jet carburation is used throughout. In this car of less weight and less air drag, this means still greater savings in gasoline. In addition, the engine's compression ratio has been raised to 7.25 to 1, a ratio which squeezes still more power out of every drop of the regular gasoline for which this engine was designed. In bringing a velvet soft ride to the Rambler, Nash engineers met and solved problems new to the American automobile industry. For instance, in the front suspension, longer, more flexible coil springs do a better job of absorbing road shocks. As a result, there's a feather soft ride, since there's less unsprung weight and the springs are more effectively positioned, closer to the wheels. Because the new spring location causes less strain on the suspension mechanism, wheel alignment remains correct for longer periods. In designing the rear springs, Nash engineers tested many types of springs. They realized that the springing used on other Nash cars might not be best for a car of the Rambler's weight and characteristics. In these tests, a combination of semi-elliptic springs and Hotchkiss drive gave superior results. So that's the design found on the Rambler today. Every Rambler Lando has as standard equipment at no extra cost, whether I, radio, custom upholstery, foam rubber seats, front and rear, directional signals, custom steering wheel, electric clock, courtesy light, and chrome wheel discs. All these are items most every buyer wants on his car. Yet if they were bought and installed individually at accessory list price, they would total more than $300. Of course, their cost is considerably less to a Rambler purchaser, since quantity purchases and production line installation mean important savings which are passed on to the buyer. This means a big price advantage over any other full-size convertible built in America today. This, then, is the car that's been born, a bright star in the automotive sky, worthy of its place in the distinguished company of the Nash Ambassador and the Nash Statesman. Here is a car a man can care about, a car which invites strong opinions because it dares to be different. It's the compact car that seats five comfortable people. The nimble-footed, high-performing car. It's the safest convertible ever built, as rigid and solid as any closed car. It's the high-styled car with the continental flair. Here is the car for the young in years and the young in heart. For the quick of mind and the sure of taste for the people who always have the best of the new things first, and who therefore know the Nash Rambler Lando for what it is, a car of tomorrow that's here today. In a word, this is the car built for those who will recognize it at first sight as theirs, who at long last can say with instant certainty, this is our kind of car. Well, looks as if there's another happy Nash owner. And who wouldn't be happy to take home a new 1950 air flight? Say, wait a minute. Maybe we spoke too soon. Uh-oh, something else wrong? A grease smear on the proud owner's coat? Well, it should have been a happy occasion. But it has certainly turned plenty sour. Mishaps like these shouldn't happen. But they do. And there are owners' letters of complaint on file to prove it. There are complaints far more serious than grease stains. For instance, there are the door latches which are not adjusted properly. They cause difficult operation or rattles. Two things which quickly make the owner unhappy and dissatisfied with his new car. 
Then, too, there are the brakes which froze up, leaving the new owner stranded on the highway. A brake test and adjustment before delivery would have prevented that. There are owners who were baffled by door and trunk locks, simply because nobody at their dealership would spare a minute to tell them how they worked. A similar lack of explanation has often turned a Nash feature into a drawback. As in the case of the ambassador owner, who decided his car just didn't have the passing power he needed. And all because nobody ever told him there was such a thing as an automatic overtake. So he just blamed the engine. Not enough moxie. Well, some of these incidents may seem funny to us, but they're expensive humor. After all, the Nash owners of today are the Nash buyers of tomorrow, they and their friends. Therefore, lost owners mean lost sales. And lost sales mean lost money for you in the buyer's market of today. However, there are lots and lots of owners of Nash Air Flights who believe they've had the world's best deal from the world's best dealer. Most of those owners are like Joe Fairchild, and Joe is sold for good. Why? Well. Joe can answer that question himself. Just a few days ago, as he was leaving for work, a neighbor, Henry Smith, hailed him. Hi, Joe. Give me a lift downtown, will you? Sure, Hank. Climb in. But how come you're not driving that new eight-cylinder job of yours? Oh, the same old reason. It's in the shop again. I never learn. What do you mean, Hank? Well, the darn thing's never been right since the day I bought it. I keep thinking I'm going to get somewhere, taking it back to the pirate I bought it from. Well, what happens then? Uh, generally not a doggone thing. Except that I ride the bus or bum rides for a couple of days while they fiddle around, getting no place. I'm disgusted. But I guess all dealers are the same. Hank, I just don't think you've been to the right dealer. What do you mean by that? Well, take my Nash dealer. My car was an A1 shape, and I knew everything on it, forwards and backwards, before they let me have it. And after I got it... They even called me up and reminded me when I was about due for my 1,000 and my 2,000 mile inspections. You can't beat them for good. Well, you see what we mean. The Nash dealer who has men like Joe Fairchild boosting him is selling tomorrow's buyers. He's making sure his tomorrows will be profitable. Now, the question is, how did Joe Fairchild get to be such an enthusiastic booster? There's a definite answer. Joe's dealer, Al Jones, followed the Nash new car delivery program point by point. In fact, Al sees to it that every new car is serviced for a special delivery. And when the first 1950 Nash Air flight arrived at his dealership, as he has every year in the past, Al Jones called all his people together. He knew that the new cars would provide his dealership's number one opportunity to make new friends and keep old ones. So he told his team, we've got the finest Nash cars that ever hit the highways. You know what they will do. and Maybe you know what they will do for us. They will make money for all of us. But let's remember this. There'll be people driving these new cars who never owned a Nash before. They'll see our cars, like them, and buy them. Now that's swell. But this will mean real money to us only if they keep on buying Nash cars and Nash service here. Then we'll have some real customers. And customers are the people who keep the paychecks coming. So, we must be sure every car we deliver is right. We've got to stop complaints before they happen. That means we all have a job to do. Now you, Ed. Yes, Al Jones is a smart dealer. He knows that any new car may need adjustments and tuning when it comes from the factory. He also knows that if those things are not taken care of before delivery, they may grow into more serious and costly complaints. Therefore, Al Jones makes sure that his cars are ready for delivery. He sees that every operation on the delivery and inspection form is carried out and adjustments made where necessary.
set, Harry? Ready for the final road test, Ed. She's been completely checked up to this point. Well, I'll soon know when I give it the old proving ground test. Okay, give her the works. So Ed put that car through its paces on his own proving ground. A regular course which he and Al Jones have laid out to duplicate driving conditions. It includes these railroad tracks, a stretch of fairly rough road, a deserted stretch where he can step on it a little, and finally, a couple of nice sharp corners, which in this case showed Ed. Say, Harry, you better recheck the caster. She doesn't straighten out quite right on the corners. Otherwise, she's first class. Yes, Joe Fairchild's new air flight is now ready for delivery, but only after Al Jones' staff has gone over every single detail. They've made sure Joe would be satisfied. And now, to see that Joe is kept happy, Jones arranges for the car to be delivered by his service manager, the man who represents customer contact from delivery on. All set for delivery, Bob? Everything's okay, Mr. Jones. Owner's manual, service policy, identification card, and all the rest of the stuff is on my desk. The car's been checked and double-checked. I'll be sure to cover everything with Mr. Fairchild, particularly the warranty service. Yes, as we said before, Al Jones is a smart operator. He knows that delivery is the beginning rather than the end of selling automobiles and service. So he paves the way for the man who's responsible for maintenance. The man who prescribes for the car's operations, who can make the difference between a happy customer and an unhappy one. Then when Joe Fairchild comes in, I'd like you to meet our service manager, Bob Merkel. Bob, this is Mr. Fairchild. I claim Bob's the best service manager in town. <laughs> well, we try, Mr. Fairchild, but Mr. Jones is a pretty tough boss, sort of keeps us on our toes. Anyway, Mr. Fairchild, we're mighty happy to have you driving a Nash. We're gonna do everything we can to make driving it a real pleasure for you. As a matter of fact, while we're walking over here to the new car delivery area, I'd like to show you some of the equipment we have here to keep that Nash of yours in tip-top condition. For instance, Here's our diagnosis department. We're real proud of it. It's a wonderful setup for helping us find and take the kinks out of cars in a hurry. As you probably know, these are the most modern instruments for checking an engine to determine its service needs. They do it fast. They uh, take out the guesswork that can be expensive. And of course, nobody knows the fine points of lubricating your Nash as well as our Nash trained mechanics. In fact, Every man here is a factory trained mechanic. They know everything there is to know about your car. Not only that, we use nothing but genuine Nash parts. We find that that's the only way to guarantee the best results on any job. Well, here's your car, Mr. Fairchild. You've got a good automobile there. I'm sure it'll give us good service, Bob. Is it all ready to go? All set, Mr. Fairchild. But uh, first, I'd like to go over the weather eye and some of the other mechanical features with you. This weather eye is the finest heating unit and air circulator in any car today. You can select any temperature you want. You see, this control, that's the stuff, Bob. Make sure he knows what every feature on that new air flight is and how it works. The weather eye, the hydromatic drive with exclusive selector lift starting, the uniscope, the radio, the twin beds, and all the other features of these great new air flights. That's why Joe Fairchild was really sold when he first got his car. Because Al Jones sold him on his place of business and his facilities, as well as on the new Nash air flight. Then a few weeks later, when Bob, the service manager, called Joe Fairchild to remind him of his 1,000-mile inspection. Joe was happy to bring in his car. There certainly isn't much that needs fixing. A couple of little things I'd like to have you look at, but by and large, she's running like a charm. Glad you're satisfied, Mr. Fairchild, but uh, let's go over these little things you mentioned. Of course, any new car needs minor adjustments the first two or three months, and we're going to give your car a thorough inspection. For example, we want to inspect your brake system. It's a double check for safety. We want to inspect the steering assembly. 
see that all the parts are operating correctly in relation to one another. Then too, some of the water, oil, and fuel connections may need tightening now that you've driven the car for a while. We'll inspect them all. In fact, here's a list of the inspections and operations we feel are necessary at 1,000 miles. You see, we want to keep your car in the best possible condition because it's as much a part of our job to keep you happy with your Nash as it is to sell you the car in the first place. Well, at any rate, I'll have to admit that you fellows are thorough. Yes, they're thorough at Al Jones. And because they are, they've got a thoroughly sold customer in Joe Fairchild. Naturally, Joe's going to pass the word along to people in his office whenever the subject of cars and service comes up. And he's going to talk to his friends, because people like to brag about their cars and their dealers, especially when there is a point of superiority. And they'll all talk any time and any place they get a chance. We certainly don't have to tell you that the word-of-mouth advertising of satisfied customers is the best guarantee for the continuing success of your dealership. For example, let's find out what happened in the case of Henry Smith the morning Joe Fairchild gave him a ride downtown. As I was saying, Hank, if you want real service, you ought to see this Nash dealer of mine. As a matter of fact, I'm going to drop the car off now for my 2,000-mile inspection. Why don't you stop in with me? You'll see what I mean. Well, Joe, I figure all dealers are pretty much the same, but, well, I'll stop in with you for a minute. Hi, Mr. Fairchild. Come in for your 2,000-mile inspection? Yes, Bob. Well, I'll get one of the boys on it right away, Mr. Fairchild. How's she running? Wonderful, Bob. Not a complaint. Uh, by the way, meet Mr. Smith, a neighbor of mine. I want to show him your diagnosis department. Go right ahead. Uh, if you want any questions answered, just ask one of the boys. Uh, by the way, uh, I suppose you want your car tonight, Mr. Fairchild? Say, these people certainly seem to be friendly. Was he kidding when he asked you if you wanted your car tonight? Of course he wasn't kidding. That's the kind of service I've had ever since I first came here. I tell you, these fellows are tops. Say, that's really something. You know, maybe I will bring my car in here. Well, it looks as though the Jones Nash organization has the right idea. They've made one friend in Joe Fairchild, and it looks like they have a good start on another one in Henry Smith. Yes, they make a lot of good friends and good customers. And not just for today, but for all the tomorrows that lie ahead. They're securing a profitable future for their dealership and for everyone in that dealership. And all because the Jones Nash organization is smart enough to sell the quality of their service to gain the friendship and confidence of their new Nash owners by making every new car delivery a special delivery. Russell Nash Corporation. Yes, this is the dealership of Charlie Russell. Charlie recently has become concerned about the falling off of his service business. And right now, he's holding a meeting with his service organization to talk over with them what they must do to build up their service business. Let's listen in. A short while ago, I became concerned about the drop in our service business. So Jim and I went over the records, and we discovered that some of our service customers weren't coming back. Naturally, we wondered why. So I picked out a number of names, and I personally contacted those people to find out what was the matter. Now, you and I think we run a good service department, but you're going to be shocked when you hear what some of those people told me. Here's what just a few of them said. The last time I was in your place, no one paid any attention to me. Sure, your men were busy, but at least someone might have spoken to me while I waited. So I gave up and left. Your service department never did find the trouble. Your man said he checked the ignition and the carburetor. I paid for some new parts, but the car didn't run any better. When I brought it back, he said he'd try something else. Why should I pay for experiments? The work wasn't done right. I had to take the car back three times before you really fixed it. I can't afford to lose all that time. I'd rather take it where they fix it right in the first place. They told me the car would be ready on Thursday. When I called for it, they said I couldn't get it till the next day. It was short of parts or something. 
I lost a day's pay because I couldn't get to work without the car. They gave me an estimate of $18. But when I called for the car, I was handed the bill for $30. If I tried that on my customers, I'd be out of business. I had my car lubricated. After I got home, I found grease on my gloves and a spot on my coat. I had to have them cleaned. That's expensive and inconvenient. So now I take the car to service people who are more careful. Now, each one of these people, who once were customers of ours, had some reason for feeling we had given poor service or treatment. So they just quit coming here and began taking their service business somewhere else. Well, you and I can't afford to lose any customers. So let's take a look at the things I found our customers want. Here they are. Prompt attention, courtesy, and helpful interest. Accurate diagnosis. Good workmanship in taking care of the work ordered, delivery as promised. Repair charges as quoted. And the car returned in clean condition. Now bear in mind that none of these customers felt that we did everything wrong. But the point is, it takes only one wrong step to make a customer dissatisfied and to lose his business. That means that each one of us has to do his job right. We've all got to work together so that we give the customer just what he wants every time. Because, and here's what it's all about, unless customers are satisfied here, they'll go somewhere else for service and for their new and used cars too. We should never forget that the customer is the most important person in our business because it's the money he spends here that makes our jobs possible. He pays our wages and keeps us in business. So the question we have to answer is, how do we give the customer the service he wants? Well, it seems to me that one sure easy way is try to look at things as the customer sees them. If we changed places with the car owner, we'd see things a lot differently. Let's see how we could have satisfied those customers I've just told you about if we'd try to see things as they saw them. For example, let's take that druggist who left because he wasn't waited on properly. Hmm, the, the car doesn't seem to have the pep it used to. I think I'll stop in at the dealers and let him check it. Now, of course, the first thing Jim should do is to wait on the customer as soon as possible. If he's busy with another customer, then he should say, Good morning, sir. I'll be right with you. All right, but I hope you won't be too long. I'm in kind of a hurry. Greeting the customer promptly is just ordinary courtesy. And he won't mind waiting a while if he knows you're thinking about him. You know, people become impatient while waiting because even a minute seems like a long time. I wonder if you realize how slowly time passes to someone who's waiting. Now, to prove this, I'm going to stop talking for exactly half a minute by my watch, and you can see for yourselves how long it seems. That half minute seemed mighty long, didn't it? Well, imagine how the customer feels when he has to wait much longer for someone to take care of him. So, if Jim is away from the door when an owner comes in, then anyone who sees the customer should step up to him like this. Good morning, sir. May I help you? I'd like someone to check my car. Yes, sir. We'll be glad to do that. I'll get our service manager for you. Then let's get someone quickly. And if we can't, go back and tell the customer. Don't leave him waiting. Remember, we work here every day and we feel at home. But the customer needs to be made to feel we're glad he came in by giving him prompt attention and a friendly reception. There are lots of other places that customers can go to for service. And we're the losers if they spend their money there instead of here. Then, as soon as we've greeted the customer, let's find out what he wants. Let him tell us what he thinks is wrong. He wants to tell us and will resent our interrupting or being impatient at this point. So take the time to listen to his whole story because by listening to what the customer says, we can tell what's on his mind and how to handle his particular problem. He may realize that his car isn't running right and he looks to us to tell him what is needed to fix it. Like this. The car doesn't have the power it used to. 
I notice it on hills and in passing on the highway. What do you suppose is the matter? That's one kind of an owner. He relies on us to help point out what his car needs. Another customer may know exactly what he wants us to do. I want the motor tuned up. How much will it be and how soon can I get it? Regardless of what we think the customer needs, we should first direct our entire attention to finding out what he wants. Next, we probably will want to ask him some questions. Then, if we feel he needs something else, we can point it out after we have more facts about his car and how it's been performing. Now, another situation. If the owner has a complaint, we need to be most careful as to how we handle him. Here, it is most important to put ourselves in his place, for he's probably angry, and if we're not careful, we can very easily lose him as a customer. So, let's see just how you handle the customer with a complaint. Say, remember when I was in here the other day? You were supposed to fix that noise in my engine. Well, it's back again. Now, the worst thing we could do with that customer would be to argue with him. The fact is, if there's something bothering him, we should be glad he came back to us to give us another chance instead of going around town knocking us. Here's a good way to handle it. I'm sorry you had this trouble, Mr. Rogers, but I'm glad you came back to tell me about it. I know just how you feel, and we'll check it right away. Say, this fellow's all right. No argument or anything. I think he really wants to take care of this. If we'll just keep in mind how the customer thinks and feels about his problems, if we'll just put ourselves in his place, we're off to a good start in giving him the service he expects. So, the first step in satisfying the customer is give him prompt attention, courtesy, and helpful interest. Listen to his whole story. Don't argue. And take care of what the customer wants first. Now we're ready for the next step. Accurate diagnosis. Here we have another fine chance to show the customer that his interests are first with us and that we're anxious to give him the very best service. We have the equipment and we know how to use it. Let's put them to work. For instance, Mr. Wilson, the trouble you mentioned could be caused by the ignition, the carburation, the condition of the valves, or a number of things. Before recommending any repairs to you, I suggest that we first get all the facts about what's causing the trouble. This engine analyzer is a scientific instrument that will tell us exactly what your engine needs to give it the power and the performance you expect. I don't want to spend any more than I have to. Our diagnosis may actually save you money. It protects you from paying for something your car doesn't need. It'll tell us the exact reason for the trouble. Then we'll know what it takes to fix it. At the same time, diagnosis will uncover anything else that's wrong. We'll give you a complete report and you don't have to buy anything you don't want. But by analyzing the engine, we can tell you exactly what's causing the trouble. You can watch the test yourself. Okay, if you start right away, I'll wait. I have a few minutes to spare. Well, Mr. Wilson, our analysis of your engine shows that your valves need grinding. That and an engine tune-up should make your car run like new. Can I be sure of having the car by 5 o'clock? It'll be ready for you, Mr. Wilson. All right, go ahead. Now, that brings us to the third step in satisfying the customer. Good workmanship in taking care of the work order. Here's where you mechanics come into the picture. If the cars you work on belong to personal friends of yours, You'd probably work on them with extra care to be sure you fix them right. Well, every customer is a friend because it's his service business that keeps us on the job. He's a friend who deserves the best work we can give him. And remember this, to the customer, his car is usually the only one he has. Its proper performance means a lot to him and he'll notice any little thing that isn't taken care of right. So, good work by you mechanics is an important part in the teamwork necessary to keep customers satisfied and coming back. Then, of course, we want to be sure we make delivery as promised. And that means getting the work done on time. People are often inconvenienced without their cars. For example... Marge, our car is down at the Nash place being fixed. It'll be ready at 2 o'clock. Could you give me a ride over there? Oh, thanks. I'll be so glad to get our car back. I needed to go marketing. If you find it's impossible to finish the job on time, let Jim know immediately so he can notify the owner. Then let's be sure we call the customer and at least savor the inconvenience of waiting around or even having to make another trip back. Mrs. Brown, 
This is Jim Milton, the service manager at Russell Nash. I'm sorry, Mrs. Brown, but the work on your car will take longer than we thought, and your car won't be ready till 4.30. Oh, dear. I counted on getting it at 2. But I guess I can make other arrangements. Thank you, anyway, for calling me. I'll be there at 4.30. You see, it's just a matter of being considerate of the customer's time and feelings. And the same rule applies when repair charges are going to be higher than quoted. If we see that the job requires extra parts and labor that were not quoted on the original order, or if there's something else that should be taken care of in the owner's interest, let's call the customer and talk it over with him. Like this. Mr. Osborne, while working on your car, we notice that there's a small leak in the radiator. We could fix it while we're doing the rest of the job. Mm-hmm. Now, how much is it? Well, I suppose you ought to do it. Can I still get the car at five? Okay, go ahead. Here is where the radiator was leaking, Mr. Osborne. See here, where it's rusted. Yeah, glad you caught it. It could have caused me plenty of trouble. And that brings us to step six in satisfying the customer. Delivering the car in clean condition. This is most important because anyone is going to be sore if they get their clothes or hands smeared with grease. Using covers properly and a final wipe with a clean rag is all it takes to keep the customer from experiencing this annoyance. And when customers feel happy about every step in servicing their cars, they not only come back, but they tell their friends about us. They know how to treat you when you get there. They're courteous and act as though they really want to help you. They have the equipment to diagnose what's wrong. No fooling around with guesswork and having to go back and try something else. They showed me my trouble exactly while I watched them. Take it to Russell Nash. They fix it and fix it right the first time. They don't pile up charges after they give you an estimate. The car's ready when they tell you. You ought to try it, Joe. Why, we've never had that trouble with our dealer. They seem to be so careful in keeping the car clean. Well, fellas, I know that's the way we all want our customers to talk about our service. And they will, if we just remember to put ourselves in their place. Now, let's review just what it is that the customer wants. Prompt attention courtesy and helpful interest make customers easier to deal with, easier to satisfy, and make our jobs more pleasant. Accurate diagnosis and good workmanship are the two things we must do if we're going to keep our customers satisfied. It also gives you the satisfaction of knowing you're part of a team that does its job well. Delivery as promised, repair charges as quoted, and the car returned in clean condition each is an important part of our jobs, and they make our jobs more secure, too. So, no matter what our own individual jobs are and the steps needed to make the customer happy, every one is important, and we'll get the job done right if we keep one thing in mind. Let's try to do everything, look at everything, as the customer sees it. If customers are happy with us and with our service, they'll come back here for service. And because we keep them satisfied, they'll come back here for their new cars. And all because we look at it as the customer sees it. There's Walt Evans, a used car salesman. And he doesn't look too happy. Let's ask him what's the matter. What's the matter? Plenty. Business hasn't been too good for me. Only two people in all day. And they were just lookers. Here I need money to pay a hospital bill. And my roof started leaking last night. And I was just wondering where I'm going to sell a car. If you can help me sell a used car, I'm ready to hear about it. Well, that's just what we dropped in to talk about. How you can sell more used cars. As a salesman... Time is one of the most valuable things you have. And you can sell more cars by taking full advantage of your time. But let's start from the beginning. If you could see your whole territory from an airplane, its business areas, manufacturing plants, and residential sections, you'd get a better appreciation of what a big potential you have to draw from. And then, when you take a closer look to see all the cars in your territory and realize that two-thirds of them were bought as used cars, well, you'll have to admit that there's a big market for the very thing you're selling. You know, 
For every 12 people in the average community, a used car is purchased each year. So there's plenty of used car business done every day. Now, you couldn't hope to contact all the used car prospects, and you don't have to. Even a small percentage of the buyers would give you all the business you could handle, and a mighty fine income, too. If you manage your time properly, you can bring a sufficient number of those prospects to you. It's a sort of uh, channeling process. Here's about the way things have been with you, Walt. A few prospects dropping in, and then a long wait without much to do. What you should have is a steady stream of people to talk to and sell. And you can have that steady stream if you build up the feeder lines from every part of your territory so that enough prospects are channeled into contact with you. Oh, yeah? And how do I do that? By making constructive use of your time while you're not actually dealing with prospects. Here's how you do it. As a salesman, you pretty much control how you use your time. To a large extent, we might say you're your own sales manager. So, you ought to have a plan of work so that everything you do is actually helping you sell a car. You can thereby channel more and more prospects to come in contact with you and thus increase your sales. Now, here are some suggestions. The morning meeting at your dealership is the time to get all set for the day's work. At the meeting, you can bring your list of used cars up to date by removing any cars delivered on the previous day and by adding the cars just taken in trade. It's also a good idea to note what cars have been sold but not yet delivered. And to make a note of trades that are coming in on unfilled orders involving trades. The morning meeting is also the time to jot down any price revisions, any cars bearing an extra sales bonus, and what cars are being featured in the day's advertising. Another good idea is to make known the types of cars for which you are having calls so that the new car salesman can try to trade such automobiles. By the end of the morning meeting, you should have up-to-the-minute information on the used car situation in your dealership for the day. Now, the next step is a complete examination of cars placed on the lot since the previous day. You can spend some time profitably doing this while there are no prospects to wait on. Note the condition of the tires and whether they are black or white wall. Whether the car has a radio, heater, clock, automatic transmission, or any other accessory or piece of equipment that will contribute to a more effective presentation of the product. By all means, be sure you know how to operate the starter and other controls. And, of course, you'll know the main facts about the car, the features which sold the car when it was new. And you'll want to check the trunk for size, tire location, and the method of opening. Find out the series of the car and whether it's super, custom, special, or any other classification that may have a bearing on its presentation to the prospect. And acquaint yourself with all features that have a special appeal to buyers. Information like weight, horsepower, gas tank capacity, and so forth can be looked up in guidebooks as needed. Now for Nash cars, the Nash Used Car Data Book furnishes information on all Nash cars from 41 to 49. Of course, any car that needs attention should be reported promptly. Flat tires fixed, appearance items attended to, and the whole stock should be kept arranged in an attractive display. Every salesman needs a thorough knowledge of the product he sells. In used cars with so many makes, models, series, and years, Sufficient knowledge of the product can only come from studying and inspecting cars in stock whenever you can. Learning all about the cars on your lot is just one way to make profitable use of your time while not selling to prospects. Another way of using your time is to send out mailing pieces to attract prospects to your place of business. Now you can do this any time of the day whenever you have a few minutes to yourself. Working from a registration list or an owner file You'll find it easy to send out 25 to 50 cards a day, making good use of time that might otherwise be wasted. Now, to help you with this activity, Nash has a selected group of attractive postcards picturing automobiles like those displayed on your lot. There's space on the card for a brief message, and in Nash's guide to used car merchandising, there are even suggested messages to use, like the one shown here. And while you're on the lot, you can use your time profitably, too, by keeping a prospect list and following up people who don't buy on the first contact. If you can't sell the prospect, 
You can usually get his name, address, and phone number by telling him you'll let him know as soon as you get the kind of car he's looking for. Put all this information on a prospect card. Then, you can phone him the next day and tell him about any cars traded in or expected that will fill his needs. If the prospect hasn't already bought, that short phone call may lead to the sale. Or if you can't reach the prospect by phone, drop him a postcard to get across the same message as you would on the phone call. But do it the same day, because used car prospects generally don't wait too long. Prospect follow-up only takes a few minutes that might otherwise be wasted, but it pays off in extra sales. Well, I must admit that idea worked better than I thought. You got any more suggestions? Sure. While you're at the lot, you can also use your time profitably by making a courteous phone call to any owner who bought from you a few days before. Ask him how he likes the car. Yeah, and suppose the owner starts squawking about a lot of things he wants fixed. Well, if the customer has a complaint, you're better off letting him get it off his chest than to have him go around knocking you and your dealership, aren't you? If he has a just complaint, arrange to have it taken care of as soon as possible on a basis that's fair to all concerned. If the owner's looking for something he's not entitled to, you're better off facing the situation and talking it over with him. You can usually come to some agreeable understanding and still keep his goodwill. Owners are your best advertisements, and you should make every effort to keep this advertising favorable. It's another way to make profitable use of time while you're on the lot without customers to wait on. Now, when you're away from the lot, there are other ways to make good use of time to produce sales. For example, suppose you've made an appointment with a prospect, and when you get there, you find he's been delayed and can't see you for an hour or so. You don't have to waste that hour. It's a good time to tag some parked cars by sliding your business card under the wiper blade or on the front seat with a message to suit the occasion, like this. We need cars like this one and can give you a good deal if you'd like to trade. Or you might say this. We have a buyer for this type of car. Would you consider trading it in? Or you can think up some message of your own. You can distribute a large quantity of cards quickly around places like factory parking lots, supermarkets, theaters, and wherever cars are parked in big groups. You don't have to set aside any special part of the day for an activity like tagging parked cars. It's just good management on your part to use your time like this whenever you have no prospects to wait on. Another profitable use of your time is to make your own deliveries to customers. You know, people appreciate this little courtesy and attention, and they'll help you in return. If a trade is involved, ask the owner if he has a relative or friend who might be interested in the traded car. Many good prospects are obtained and sold this way. And if the prospect doesn't buy the car traded in, he may still be a prospect for some other car in stock. Another good prospecting idea is to follow up owners as they pay off on their time payment contracts. Contact these people as soon as a finance company notifies your dealership that the payments have been completed. Contact paid up time buyers before they decide to use their monthly payments to buy something else, like a television set or another car from a competitor. And while you're away from the lot, take time to set up a system of prospect spotters, people who can supply you with the names of live prospects. But I do that already. I'm here now to talk to Tom about what prospects he's picked up around his gas station. And Joe the barber tips me off on a good lead whenever he can. Well, that's the general idea, and it's fine as far as it goes, but it doesn't go far enough. Do you have enough prospect spotters, and do you work on the plan systematically? If you could find out the name of every prospect in town who's going to buy a car each day, you'd have a system worth a fortune. Of course, you can only uncover prospects by contacting people or by attracting them to your dealership, and by yourself, you can just reach so many. What you need are enough spotters in contact with large streams of people so that a sufficient number of prospects are channeled in your direction where you can sell them. Now, lots of people in town are in a position to know who's thinking of buying a car. Go see them. The foremen at the factories generally know when someone in their department is in the market for a car. Find out who the foremen are and go see them, at home if necessary. Attendants in parking lots are on friendly terms with a large number of car owners and can tip you off on who's going to buy. Shopkeepers like druggists, grocers, and butchers wait on a lot of people every day and know a good deal about their customers' business, including their needs in cars. 
People who work in eating places also make good prospect spotters. And you can probably think of a lot more people yourself who'd make valuable spotters for you. Personal calls are necessary to establish the contacts. And you can stop to see them whenever you're in the neighborhood with a little spare time. And perhaps once a week, drop them a list of used cars available with a personal message written by hand. This will maintain and strengthen your working arrangement with them. Remember, the larger your list of spotters, the more chance you have of locating prospects who are ready to buy and of having them channeled in your direction so you can sell them. You know, as a used car salesman, you have a great many advantages that men don't have in other lines. Your merchandise is always different and interesting because it keeps changing from day to day and from year to year. Every used car in stock is an individual unit with its own particular features and sales appeals for various prospects. Your market is tremendous. Two out of three cars purchased are used cars. And right here in town, hundreds of them are bought every month. To get your share of this business, plan to manage your time. Use it profitably, even when you're not actually dealing with prospects. Use the time at the morning meeting to bring your used car list up to the minute as to stock, prices, and special activities. Keep thoroughly familiar with your stock by studying and inspecting every car added from day to day. Fill the odd moments at the dealership by sending out mailing pieces and for following up prospects and owners. Whenever you deliver a car, ask the owner for the name of a prospect who might be interested in his trade-in. When away from the lot, whenever you have some time available, use it for tagging parked cars and for developing your system of prospect spotters. To sum it all up, time is one of your greatest assets. Manage it. Use it to produce the greatest number of sales for you. Make all of your time pay off.